and welcome to Thrift Shop Biography. This is the one about Sinead O'Connor. Thank you for listening. Hello. Hi. So this week we have been reading the autobiography of Sinead O'Connor. Yes, we have. Oh, I have so many thoughts and feelings about this Of course you do. I can't wait to talk about it. I can't wait to talk about it. But tell me, before you read this book, what did you think about Sinead? Well, I don't know anything about her. I know through you, occasionally you've told me, oh, she's in a bit of a mess. If I didn't know that, I would never have known anything more about her after she had a big hit with Nothing Compares to You. I haven't listened to any of her other music. Wow. I've not seen her in interviews. I've never seen her in concert. I don't know what she's capable of, and now I do. It's yeah. been an education, this. And it's not just the book, but following it up with YouTube and listening. There's been a massive education on this person. But, OK, you tell me, because I know you love her, but tell me more how you feel. Oh, I could fill this whole hour with just how I feel about yeah. Sinead O'Connor. I've loved her ever since she first came onto the scene. Like her first album before yeah, she had, I had hit. it. Yeah. You just loved it straight away. Yes. Wow. Absolutely loved her. She's one of the few artists where I've bought almost every single album they've done. Like I totally followed her career. And being in the front row while she sang live was not just one of the best concert experiences I've had. I would say it's one of the best experiences of my whole life. Oh, my God. I She, there's something very unique and special about her and her voice, and I've always been completely interested in her. Wow, she yeah. really speaks to you, sings oh, to you. Yeah, she does. It's just also like the lyrics and stuff. We'll get into it, but the work is so personal yeah. oh and all that her singing teacher Let, let's yeah. get in let's oh, get yeah. into it let's all get right. into it can't wait go <laughs> <laughs> so Sinead O'Connor yes was born in Ireland yes in Dublin in 1966 that's exactly right <laughs> <laughs> so her mum is called Marie and her dad was John they married in 1960 They'd been married a couple of years before they started having a family, which, mm. to be honest, sounds a bit unusual because a lot of That's these true, books... because they're Catholics and they yeah, don't have... You've got to get married yeah. first or Jesus You've got to get married and there's it. no contraception, yeah. Yeah, but if you have a child out of wedlock, you get sent to a Magdalene laundry. Oh, and they nick your kid off you. We learned that in oh, this. Oh, yes. <laughs> so they had a couple of kids, Joe and Emar, and then a couple of years later, little Sinead was born. And then a couple of years later, her little brother, John, was mm. born. And then she says, in 1975, my father sensibly left my mother. Mm. I definitely clock from this book that she misses out tons. You have to read between the lines some of the times. For example, her dad leaving sensibly but she doesn't go and live with him until she does and then she runs away and then she's back to her mum. There's a lot missed out. Yeah. You have to fill in gaps. And then she sort of briefly, in a sentence, mentions that her dad had to battle custody for the kids, but that Ireland didn't really favour the fathers. So he lost custody, but she didn't know that he was even trying to get hold of him. Mm -hmm. So she resented him forever and hated him because she thought he didn't care. She didn't know he was trying to see them and her mum wasn't letting him. It's so complex. This is a royally fucked up childhood, all in capital letters, cannot emphasise more. Just the complexity of it. Like, she obviously has a lot of hatred for her mother, but then also, after going and living with her dad, her and her little brother, go back to live with their mum because yeah. they miss her. Yeah, I know, it's really messed up. Right, you know, really early on in these podcasts where you couldn't understand why Joan Crawford's abused kid still loved her. Yeah, right. This sends it to whole other levels. Now, you're not going to doubt it anymore, yeah. are you, after all these books? There's some really crazy thing that makes kids love their parents, even though that horrendously abusive. Mm -hmm. Not all, but it's a, there's a lot. Mm -hmm. Right, I have to say, she didn't go into too much detail in this book. But then, because she mentions later on in her life going on Dr Phil... Yeah. I Googled that. She gives a lot more details than she gives right. in this book, and now I really understand how bad it was. She mentions that her mum makes her lie naked on the floor with her arms and legs spread open... She repeatedly stomps her womb, anything to try to crush her womb. She says her mother doesn't want her to be a woman. She wants to kill the woman in her. That's, oh my God, it's... But then she says, I wasn't just raped by my mother. Right. 
That's the first time she says she was. Yeah, by saying right. that, she says I was raped by many adults, and Dr. Phil says, by who and what age? She said, oh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, by many adults. And she said, he, she says in that, it was a torture chamber. Our house was a torture chamber. We lived in the same clothes for years. They were never washed. We smelled. My mum smelled. She smelled of evil. That's just expanding on what she touches upon in this book. But she, yeah. She doesn't go into detail. She really doesn't go into detail. I mean, you understand that her mother is extremely mentally ill and should not be in charge of children yeah. in this book. But she doesn't go into the You don't know the details. extent of it. That's the sort of childhood where you could get rescued. It is awful, but she does waver through thinking her mum is evil on earth, but also they're still having a motherly bond to the point where she's ill one day and she stays home from school and her mum looks after her. Mm. And little Sinead is just so amazed at that that she wants that to repeat itself. Yeah, it's so messed up. Even in that interview, she starts crying, saying, he's manipulating her. He's saying, what would you do if you saw your mother? And she'd go, I would just hug her. I'd hug her and never let her go. Tell her I miss her, tell her I love her. Wow. It's really messed with her mind. And she talks about ending up in this school that's run by nuns. And the nuns are desperately trying to get her to give her mum up. And the nuns say, oh, poor Sinead, he's stroking her. And she just cries and she won't give it up. Yeah, she obviously has marks on her body from where her mum has abused her. And the nuns see that. Mm. And they're basically saying to her, we know it's your mum. Say it's your mum mm. and we can do something about it. And Sinead never did. No. I mean, if you were a social worker or works in these cases, I bet it's really textbook. There must be real psychological explanation. Yeah. But it's it's as bad as it... This is bad. But we must say, this book isn't that dark. I've added to this book by expanding on the facts as I found out on the internet, but it's a really pleasant read, it's, unbelievably. Oh, because she's very charming. I tell you what, yeah, she's so intelligent. Yeah. And for somebody who's considered mad by the world, she's so together. Well, you know, it's what the media does to these people. Yeah. A lot of the idea that the world thinks she's mad came from when she ripped the picture of the Pope up. That suddenly made her an enemy of the state. Yeah. So they told us all that she was trouble. And she was, also, she was a woman with a shaven head, which was really unusual. And so you only have to say, look at that woman with the shaven head. She's mad. Yeah. And then we all say, oh, we knew that all along. She's got a shaven head. Yeah. We're all so backwards when it comes no. to things like that. And, and I've um, watched her in interviews, in the early interviews, and she's just so intelligent. She yeah. has so much to say. Yeah. And it's not what they expect they don't get a pop star on, on an interview to talk sensibly about the war and politics and child abuse. They don't want that. Yeah. They want her to go, oh, yeah, I met Madonna last week. Yeah. That's what they want. And, and that's, she, that's why they told us all she was mad. Yes, because that's she, right. she was holding the patriarchy to account. She was. Yeah, so they made sure that she couldn't. Yeah, she was yeah. using the platform she had yeah. to, to speak her mind, and they, they don't want that. They, they don't want to give anyone any power. I learned so much about this woman. All of her life up to really near the end, she was extremely together. It's probably the sanest of the lot. Yeah. Myself, I've been on YouTube watching old interviews this week and it's kind of like, oh, she's so switched on. You forget actually how young she was as yeah. well. While all this is happening, like her massive fame, she's like 21. Yeah, I know. At the age of 21, to go on talk shows in America and just mm. talk with such authority about politics and war mm. and stuff. You know, she was a dangerous person mm. to have out there. I mean, somebody who is also brave enough to rip the picture of the Pope up, it's like, that woman is trouble. Mm. We can't have her yeah. on talk shows and yeah. stuff because she's going to bring the establishment That's right. Down which is why we need a hundred of her. I know. But we don't have I, one I, of her anymore. she properly fallen out with her mother and moved to her dad's. She'd been there a while. Her dad had remarried. He had a wife called Viola, who she really yeah, liked. Yeah, she loved her. Yeah, and she had three daughters from her first marriage and Viola and her dad had a son together. So there was four kids there already. One of her brothers was there and everything seemed to be ticking along all right. And in 1985, when she was 18, her mother suddenly died in a car crash. She skidded on black ice and went under a bus. Mm -hmm. It pulled the rug completely out from under her feet because although she'd been through hell with her mother, she absolutely loved her. And there's no way you can ever reconcile it. 
without them mm. there to do it. So mm. there's no closure can that ever happen. That sent her wild. Yeah, it did, and she didn't come to terms with her mum's death for years. Mm. If she, ever, honestly. Yeah, she grieved her a long time. And even how she was when her mum was alive, like wavering between hate and love for her, that continued yeah. after she had died. It's like the memory of her mum. One day she'd absolutely hate it, and the next day she'd miss her terribly, be yeah. grieving her something rotten. Well, what she says is that her anger over her abuse was displaced, so she takes it out on the world and not her mother. She doesn't blame her mother, so she's angry at everything else. She said that her mother was worst of all to her little brother, John, who's two years younger than mm -hmm. Sinead. Her mum would be in a room with John and she would hear John screaming and she wouldn't be able to do anything about it. So she says a lot of her anger is because she couldn't help her brother. Yeah, and it's guilt. Yeah. But then she says her older sister has the same guilt for her because she right. could hear the same oh, for her. God. Do you but, know her mum used to shut them out in the garden all yeah, night? Yeah. To the point where Sinead would be looking into the house and the mum's bedroom light was on and they'd be, Mum, Mum, let us back in. The mum wouldn't let them back in. Then the mum's bedroom light would go off mm. and they'd be like, oh, we're out here all night now. I, and that's obviously not the worst of it. No, it's not the worst of it. But I mean, who leaves their children outside all night? Well, a monster. Yeah. So she goes between her mum and her dad, right? But then eventually, Sinead is a naughty teenager. She's stealing because her mum has basically taught her. She says that her mum even steals from the collection plate in the church. I know. That's so blatant. Oh, my God, that's nuts. <laughs> and then the, and oh, then the, the charity, the charity boxes. boxes. Yeah. That, so, that becomes a really big... Money owner. And Sinead is kind of, what is she, about 13, 14 mm. at this point? So she's getting to the age where she can't blame everything on her mum. It's like she's eight or nine stealing charity boxes and mum gets the blame. But I think when you're 13, 14, you've got to start taking responsibility. Yeah. And it's around this time. She's 14 when she gets sent to... Sent to a rehabilitation centre for young girls. Again, I kind of think, was she really that bad again that's reading between the lines i don't think she really told us anything up until this point which wasn't totally acceptable for a girl who had a mother like that yeah she's running away a lot she was stealing everything she's stealing people's money out of their bags lunches anything she could steal yeah she was a proper little criminal wasn't she? yeah yeah okay yeah. so she got sent away for that probably that and i bet you they did it out of love yeah to try and set her on the right path and oddly, with schools like this, which are run by nuns, the nuns are kind of intrinsically evil, but actually they're, they're not. not here. I know, I have to say, right, every single time she talks about adults, they're really kind to her. Like, she has a crush on the bloke who ran the trip that takes them all out on the bus, and she told him, he's much older, he sat her down and said, look, I'm not interested in girls, I like men. That was the first time she heard that. But he said also, you shouldn't tell men things like this because they won't all be as kind as I am yeah. you know she was it was really lovely and the nuns are really lovely they're the first people who supported her music and bought well, her a guitar the nuns bought her a guitar yeah yeah and I they know. tried to help her talking about her mum they were actually lovely her life is peppered with really supportive really kind adults who don't abuse her mm -hmm. maybe that's just why she wrote about those ones mm -hmm. just to remind herself there were a lot of lovely people in her life it's probably how she made it through. Yeah, and so she's in the school. They are nice to her, but they also teach her some hard truths because she does run away from school. Yeah. And when she comes back, because the school is actually attached to a Magdalene laundry, mm. and when she comes back, they send her to sleep in the ward with the old women who have been in the Magdalene laundry basically their whole lives. So she's sharing the dorm with old women who are crying out for the nuns and the nurses and nobody is coming it to help like them. like some sort of hospital. She was put there deliberately, basically, because the nuns say to her, do you want to be here at this age? And she's like, no, of yeah. course not. And this will, this will happen to you. Yeah, behave yourself. Yeah. yeah, it's the best lesson she learned because she's like, I don't want that to happen to me. But she also seemed terrified for the rest of her life yeah. from that experience. Well, she said there was actually a girl in her unit who was like 22, Sinead's 14. A girl she really liked, who was just had an amazing spirit, went out to work and then came back pregnant. <laughs> I mean, it does make you wonder, though, how much they set that up. Because they let her have that child and then 
she was the happiest girl in the universe with this child. She absolutely loved it for, what, six weeks? Mm. And then it was just taken. She was absolutely distraught and it wasn't taken to the father and she didn't know what happened to it. I've seen a film about this, Philomena yeah. with Steve Coogan. Judy Dench. Yeah, and it was really, really rife for decades, if yeah. not centuries in Ireland. It was almost a factory. That's what makes me wonder, how could they let somebody go to work and come back pregnant? Is it a setup? Oh, you Because they got they paid so much money for these babies. They, oh, they, okay. they, they sold them to Americans a lot of the time. That's what that film Philomena showed, and I did look that up afterwards, and it was a lot of research on it. It really did all happen, and when they were cracking down on that particular nunnery in that film based on real life, they burned down all the records rooms so no one could ever trace anyone. <sighs> it's just at that stage, it's just yeah. so fucking evil to yeah. do that. it really is, and it's... Part of her legacy, really, because she was the one outing the abuse and outing the system that supported all types of abuse, and that is a type of abuse, yeah. massively. Yeah. She said that girl's spirit was broken. She was gone. Yeah. I mean, it's all going on in Ireland. She said that's why the Pope picture was so important to her, because her mum had had it in the room. It was her mum's picture, yeah. Yeah, from a visit the Pope had made to Ireland, and he got off the plane and kissed the floor and said, all the children of Ireland, I love you. She said, nobody loves the children of Ireland. Nobody gives a shit about the children of Ireland. And that was like her message. Mm -hmm. it, it, she was alone saying it and being slapped down for saying it. But now everybody knows all of this happened. But she was ahead of her time. Mm -hmm. So while she's yes. in the school for naughty yes. girls, the guitar teacher who comes in is getting married. And we hear this a lot in this story. The first time people hear Sinead sing, everybody's just like, what? So she's only 14 at this point and she has this beautiful mm. voice. The guitar teacher asks her to sing at her wedding. Yeah. There's footage of it on the internet, oh, by wow. the way. Little 14-year-old wow. Sinead. Yeah. So the woman getting married, the guitar teacher, her brother is a drummer in a band, an Irish band called Intuanua. So he was there hearing Sinead sing. And him and another guy in that band give Sinead a tape with some music on it and they asked her if she would write some words and basically make it into a song. And so she does. They're paying her and the nuns let her do it. And she can't believe that the nuns are letting her at the age of 14 go and record with this band. But she thinks it's because she's earning money the nuns are probably thinking, oh, it will keep her from stealing. Yeah, it's so got to be teaching her... That you can earn a yeah. living, you don't have to steal. Yeah, and she's earning it through singing and music. Yeah. Anyway, so she does it, and she gets on with everyone, but they just decide that she's just too young to front the band, so they get in this other woman to sing it, and Sinead says she felt very jealous because it's actually her words, and it was her song, and now this older woman who says is very beautiful, has a beautiful voice, is singing it. But she also says that she understands that she was too young because you can't have a 14-year-old girl singing a song where the narrator is deaf. Right? You think, oh, my no, God. No. So Sinead is 14 years old. She wrote that song. So this yeah. is her brain. At the age of yeah. 14, she's written a song where the narrator is deaf. Yeah. She's too young <laughs> to be writing songs for <laughs> So already she's writing a song with musicians and she's getting known in a small way on the Irish music yeah. scene. Yeah, and then she says she runs away so much when she runs away. She's usually busking either on the street or in pubs and doing little gigs and she gets known locally mm -hmm. as well from that. And there's another band called Tom Tom McCoot. Oh, she puts an advert in the newspaper saying, I'm a singer who wants a band. Yeah. So she traipses all over the city and it's a couple of guys with a band, which ends up being Tom Tom McCoot, Sinead is the lead singer. And then a record label from London, Ensign Records, the scout comes over to see Tom Tom McCoot and... Basically love her. They love her. Yeah. Yeah, not the band. And sometimes they go, no, take the whole band or nothing. She's like, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> She's already yeah. kind of on the way out anyway. Yeah. But she's still only about 16 here, isn't she? She's mm. really young, yeah. She cannot wait to get... She says, the best day of my life was the day I left Ireland. Yeah, right. I mean, for such an Irish icon. Well, she didn't have a great time She did there, not have did a great she? time there. By the way, all of this, Ensign Records getting in touch with her and saying, come over to London, we want to see you, happened two weeks after they buried 
her mum. Yeah, right. So that's a real moment in her life, isn't yeah. it? Her mum dies and she leaves Ireland to go to London to sign a record deal. Yeah. Wow. Really good timing. They put her straight in the studio making demos, three of which actually end up on The Lion and the Cobra, which is her first album. So she signs her recording contract in 1985. Oh, she lives with her aunt, so she isn't going over there completely. Yeah, she's on got her someone own. to live with for a she's while. She's got her auntie, but her yeah. auntie's friends with a minister, isn't she? Oh yeah, and like fancy. But Sinead ends up having an affair with the minister, and her aunt is livid, and her aunt makes out. It's because oh, he's a man of the cloth, and you shouldn't be going. And he's there. married. But actually, it's because she's jealous. Her auntie fancies a minister, yeah, yeah. and Sinead got in there first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one bloke she meets in her new band who becomes the father of her first John child. Reynolds. John Reynolds, yeah. Yes. So this is a guy that the record label have got in with Sinead, one of the musicians that she's doing a demo with. Do you want to know a little pop culture yes, fact? Yes, always. John Reynolds was one of the founding members of Transvision Vamp. What? And when, when Sinead O'Connor has her first baby, Wendy James is the babysitter. No! Yeah. Not in the book, but that's just the kind of pop culture rubbish I that's, pick up in my brain. That's a really interesting <laughs> side note. Um, so her and John hit it off, right? Yeah. The one thing I do get about Sinead in this book She's so gregarious. She'll make oh, friends with no. anyone. Yeah, she's she does. She's right in yeah. there. She'll walk into a crowded pub and make friends with she, everyone. Yeah, she's it? fearless. Yeah. And uh, very out there with her body, clearly, as well. But then that's obviously got a bit of history. She shags everybody. She says on her tour <laughs> that it was all about sex. Oh, she yeah. just went through the crew. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... It's weird because I don't like Amanda knowing her very well. I never ever really regard her as a sexual being. Yeah, I hadn't ever imagined yeah, she was. Really I think out she's there like way that. more ethereal and cerebral. Yes. yes, not so sexual. Yeah, but yeah. she obviously is. Yeah, and when she flashes that smile and uses her eyes, but it's just that she never flirts. I did see her flirting on one interview I watched. Oh my god, it was Arsenio Hall. Oh, did they have a thing? There's a bit in this book where she doesn't name the person. It's Arsenio Hall. What are you going to say about him? Well, she was really flirting with him on the programme when he interviewed her. Okay, there's a bit in this book. Should I just talk about it now? Yeah. Since you brought him up. You know the bit, the year where she boycotts the Grammys? Yeah, that was was the chat they were having. He was asking her, why aren't you going to the Grammys? She was going, I'd go with you. Oh, no. And he was saying, "Um, well, I'll take you. And she was saying, let's go now. I mean, let's just go now. Well, do you know what it happened? Shows, no. So in this book, she says she boycotted the Grammys yeah. and she went to a watch party and said to Eddie Murphy's house, she said, that night I was spiked and it terrified me. She hasn't named him in this book because she accused him about five, ten years ago online. She said it was Arsenio Hall. He got all of his lawyers onto her $5 million lawsuit. She had to apologise unequivocally and wow. say it wasn't true. I don't think she lied about that. I think abs- I think Arsenio... Oh, I can't say it because he'll say us. Oh, my God. Allegedly, Arsenio Hall spiked wow. Sinead O'Connor. Oh, she was massively Oh, my God. Flirting so, like, him. the night before she was on his chat show flirting. In front of everybody, which is probably why she couldn't say. Oh, my God. Like... Bloody hell. Anyway... Anyway. Anyway. Um, so she's yes. recording her demo. Oh, yeah, because the record company put a band together. That's how John came into it. Yeah. And, you know, even though she's living at her auntie's house, she doesn't know anybody else in London. And her and John start hanging out a lot. And they're just having a fun time. She's yeah. still young. She's just being a teenager in London. And... Portobello Road. She's, yeah. and she's got this new manager who was playing her loads of reggae and dub. She's getting this whole education in music she'd never listened to. They're hanging out at the Portobello Road. She started smoking a lot of weed. Yeah, hanging out with these rasters who were calling her little daughter and really took her in, under their wings. A lot of theological talk. Mm-hmm. This is the repeated pattern. She seeks out these people. Religion's so huge in their world as well. Religion with Sinead, I think it, from that early age, obviously, I think she saw it as a cause of all of her problems, but she didn't rebel against it. Well, she did rebel against it, but insofar as like she didn't shun it, She's just like, right, I'm finding out everything yeah. there ever is to know about every religion yeah, in the world. Yeah, she's just trying to find out information. Yeah. It does seem like that. 
Yeah. I guess she wasn't paying attention at school, so she had to get it from life. <laughs> you know, she's obviously very intelligent, so she's gathering information. She's so knowledgeable about so many different religions that if she ever wrote a book about religion and I wanted to know anything, I would trust everything Sinead O'Connor has to say. Yeah, I would, actually. So anyway, at this point, she's 19. Her two record company blokes, Nigel and Chris say to her they want her to be more feminine I love and they this. want her to wear skirts and nice little heels and some bangles and some earrings they say grow your hair a bit longer grow your hair a bit longer short hair. so she goes to her manager and tells him this and he just says shave your head fucking shave your head so she does as a rebellion against what they're trying to turn her into which just isn't her yeah. it's not what she wants to be she doesn't want to be a, a pop, pop star. star she's a musician yeah I love the bit in the book about when she actually went to get her hair shaved. Yeah, the bloke just didn't want to do it. (laughs) He went to phone her dad and check it was okay. She's like, my dad's in Ireland. Oh, look at your brother. They'll come and kill me. They're in Ireland. They've no idea where I am. (laughs) I think she even said he had, like, tears in his eyes when he was doing it. (laughs) Amazing, because girls just don't shave their hair. And the fact that he thought he needed permission from the men because yeah, right. she's owned. Yeah. Amazing. It really is a statement. I love when she went back to the record company and she walked in. Obviously, everybody was aghast. Yeah. And Chris or Nigel at the record company says to her, what are you doing? And she said, I just want to be me. And he said, well, can't you be you with hair? <laughs> <laughs> So her and John oh. are really hitting it off and they're yeah. recording the album. And then she finds herself pregnant mm. at the age of 19. She didn't expect it. She talked to John about it and they're both happy. She's so, ecstatic. So there's no question no. that she's not going to have yeah. this baby. And of course, then she goes and tells a record company. And the message that comes back to her is... The record company has spent £100,000 recording your first album. You owe it to them not to have this baby. You can't have a baby and go on tour. You can't have a baby and be a musician. Well, we all know there's some truth to that. I mean... I I kind of get... I think this is kind of pre-Nana Cherry being pregnant on top of the pops. I kind of get why a record company wouldn't want then 19-year-old new signing to be pregnant. Things were different. Mm. So they really pressured her to have an abortion. Yeah. Like, really yeah. pressured yeah. her to have. But she didn't give in. She was only 20 years old when she had Jake. And then she went on tour. And she didn't take him with her. Yeah. And she does say it's um, Jake suffered. She says it later in the book, Jake suffered the most because she really wasn't there. She absolutely loved him, but she often wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Well, you know... Well, I think we've read enough of these books now to know that when you are a world-conquering musician, it's very hard to juggle that with parenthood. Yeah. Because everybody wants a piece of you. You're in a different city every night, and it's an either-or situation. Mm. But people who try to have both of those things Mm. end up coming up short on one of them, and invariably it's the relationship with your child, Mm. unfortunately. Meanwhile, she goes off on tour. She was, they were supporting in excess. Yeah. Oh, she so, cool. says such nice things about Michael Hutchins. Yeah, he really was like a big brother, looked in after fact, her. She says that she wishes she could be like him because he yeah, was just so, so calm. calm. Yeah. Whereas she just had this temper she couldn't control. Yeah, yeah. but he always had an eye on her, even when he was talking to a group, to check she was all right. Mm-hmm. Really cool. David Bowie had just asked her, but he asked her too late. She signed up with in excess. Yeah, it's so cool him. that he asked yeah. her. And also that he saw her worth. Again, I think it's that thing. It's like the first time you hear Sinead sing, you don't forget it. So I can imagine David Bowie cottoning on to her very early in her career and thinking, damn, in excess getting there first. Hey, she also says her band was Mike Joyce and Andy Rock from The Smiths. Yes, and what a laugh they were. How utterly hilarious. Well, Morrissey doesn't say that about them, does he? (laughs) They were like taking acid when the priest came round the house and all sorts of... And they liked to cry laughing. I was like, wow, no wonder they didn't get on with Morrissey because he's not a big cry laugher. No. He's not the funniest... (laughs) Actually, he really is funny, but dry and dark. It's funny, isn't it, how you can read one book from, like, let's say, Morrissey about yeah. the two other blokes yeah. in the Smiths. We really formed an opinion about yeah. the other blokes in the Smiths. Now we read Sinead O'Connor's book, and here they pop up. They sound like a load of fun. They're, don't they just? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I believe Sinead over Morrissey. <laughs> I, <do. laughs> I believe all people can be all things. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. They just match your energy. Yes. Yeah. 
So if you're miserable like Morrissey, it brings you, you get, down. You get miserable. If you're fun and charming like Sinead, yeah. you might cry laughing. Yeah, don't forget Morrissey's problem half the time was that they'd gone out without him <laughs> yeah. and left him alone. Well, they miserable. were probably having a massive laugh. Yeah, they were cry, cry laughing. laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, poor old Mozza. Poor Morrissey. <laughs> so she's nominated for a Grammy in 1989. I remember mm. that performance. Do you? Yeah, I think that's when the world heard Sinead for the first time. Oh, I missed time. it. Again, this is how political she is and speaking up for people who don't have voices. It's hard to imagine now. But in 1989, the Grammys still didn't have a rap category. Yeah. Oh, it was the first year they introduced it, but they didn't televise that. They right. missed it out of the televised bit. Yes. Because they said they were afraid of rap. They right. didn't want to put it on TV. So she shaved Public Enemy into her head. Yeah. Which is a very cool thing to do. Yeah. And in 91, two years later, she was nominated for another award, a Grammy. This time she refused it because she said the award has become about shifting units. Yeah. She's like, well done, you've sold that many, we'll give you an award. She's like, it's not for the music. You can stuff your award. And that's basically what she did, which caused epic controversy. Because then you're shunning the whole music industry. We're not going to do what you tell us. You're questioning the authority and it all starts to crumble. And so you have to take her down. And that's what they did. Yeah. God, we need so many more Sinead's in this industry. Because she is right. Even like the Oscars, the Grammys, everything. It's just millionaires patting other millionaires on the back. It's got very little to do with that. How do you compare art anyway? Yeah. They're only a mint. She said her first contract was 7%, which means that you get 7% of the money you make, and out of that 7% comes all the expenses. Yeah. So actually, those music industry people are seeming to pat you on the back whilst making the lion's share of yeah. your money from your work. Yeah. Nobody should be allowed to highlight that, they'll be thinking. Yeah. So the first album is a massive... Well, say it's a massive success. It's a... Big Shifted success. some units. Yeah, it did. <laughs> and then she records her second album, I Do Not Want What I Have Not Got. And the record company refused it initially yeah. because they said it was way too personal. It's yeah. like reading somebody's diary, yeah. which it is. She it's says, a good observation. Yeah, she said that every album is like my diary. And, every, yeah. you, and if you really want to get to know me, you listen to my music. So you really must feel like you know yeah, her. Yeah, no, I, I, I do. Yeah. I feel I can connected to her. Yeah. Oh, we should talk about that singing teacher that her dad had. Yeah. I thought it was lovely that her dad actually even was taking singing lessons. Yeah. I feel bad for not knowing the singing teacher's name. But this method of singing that he was taught and then Sinead took her dad's singing teacher. She said that it wasn't about hitting the high notes and singing technically perfect. It was connecting to the emotion Mm. of the song. And if you can do that truthfully, then you will hit the Mm. notes and you will sing in tune and you will breathe properly. She likened it to the Lee Strasberg method acting. She said it was method singing. When I saw her live... I really felt like I was the only person in the room. Wow. So to read, actually, that she had this type of singing lesson where she's connecting with the emotion first and communicating it, it blew my mind to read you could be taught singing in that way. And just the fact that she's writing these really confessional songs born out of her own lived experience, then connecting with the music. I mean, yeah, it's, it's an amazing experience. To see her live. And she, but she's just such an amazing artist anyway. <laughs> anyway, yeah. the song that most people know her for is Nothing Compares to You. Yes, it is. Which is a cover of a Prince song. Yes, she had uh, Prince's ex-manager at that point, Steve Fagnoli. He suggested to do a cover of a Prince song because he could sort of wang licks, he knew him. And so she did Nothing Compares to You, which at that point is... an unknown Prince song he, yeah. it's a, like a B-side at best he did it with Rosie Gaines Prince fans know it most people still don't really have never heard Prince sing it no she covered it in the video she's completely thinking of her mother's death it isn't that long ago tears dropping out of her face of course that real truthful emotion in that video just swept everyone away it's in it's in the song itself you don't need the video because she said she still can't ever sing that song without thinking about her mother. Yeah. And she loves singing it. It's just unresolved grief, isn't it? Yeah. It's the reason it's such a powerful rendition of that song. 
because I'm a massive Prince fan, if anybody didn't know. He doesn't sing it as well as her. He doesn't put the emotion behind it. It's, yeah. it's a good song and he wrote it, but she nailed it. It's interesting because I'm not a massive Prince fan, but I totally respect his artistry and I do think he is brilliant. But because I came to that song the other way around, I'd heard Sinead and was so familiar with Sinead's version. Oh, I did first. too. Oh, really? Yeah. That when I listened to the Prince version, I kind of just thought, Oh, it's lacking something. Whereas I don't think any of other Prince's songs lack anything. No. I think they're brilliant. No. But because she particularly nailed that song. She absolutely nailed it. She took it to the next level. Yeah, yeah. And so Prince in comparison. Yeah, it's just yeah. doesn't mean as much. It's a good job she only covered one of his songs. So. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but that song obviously almost... Yeah, and it connected with the world. Yeah, and then she connected it forward. And it literally sold... I think it was number one in 40 countries. Yeah. It was either that or the album was number was one in 40 hit. countries. And she said the moment she knew it was number one, she just put her head in her hands. She was like, she knew it was all over. Oh, she said when they came and told her that the album was number one in America... Whoever it was who told me got cross with me because I didn't take the news happily. Instead, I cried like a child before the gates of hell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because to an artist like Sinead, massive worldwide success yeah. is not a good no, thing. No, it's, it's absolutely against <laughs> everything she ever wanted. She didn't want to be a pop star. She actually finds out that she wants to be a protest singer. Yeah, I, I think that's what she is. She is. Yeah. She just so happens to be a protest singer who became a world-famous pop that's star. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's the worst thing that could have happened to her. She didn't want to be famous. She couldn't handle it at all. But she never sought it. She just wanted to sing. Can we talk about... Prince. Where she goes to Prince's house. All right. Uh, because... Uh, yeah. Do you know what? I read it. Twice, because the chapter of where she goes to Prince's house is not just the best chapter of a book <laughs> since we started doing this podcast. What? It's like the best chapter in a book I think I've ever read. No! <laughs> it's so funny. I've worked out what's, hap- what's going on, by the way. What do you mean? All right, you t- t- say what happened and then I'll say what I think. So she gets a phone call from Prince and he says, come on over. And he sends a car. The driver drops her off. She goes and rings on the doorbell and she says this kind of weird, tall butler guy comes who seems really on edge. She describes him like Igor, like yeah. all hunched over. Oh, she has to wait ages before the door opens and the car's gone and left her there. It's real psychological missing. She, yeah, she doesn't know where she is. No. Nope. She's obviously Prince's oh, she, car is right up in the just, Hollywood Hills. Yeah, she's just where, taken her yeah. there. And then she's kind of gets into the house and again she waits ages mm. before anybody comes to see her. Yeah, and then uh, Prince turns up and he's like, oh, can I get you a drink? Yeah, OK. And he's like, slams the glass down. Well, then get it yourself. <laughs> it's just, it's so ridiculous, right? And then this Igor character comes and he looks really shaking and he looks terrified of Prince and he's all hunched over. and Oh, whatever. Anyway, it was particularly when he slammed that glass down, she said, that's the sort of behaviour my mum did very nice and then I'm going to kill you and she said it was very triggering for me because I suddenly felt in danger I felt threatened you know I'm in this strange place I've got to defend myself basically I think she got complete flashbacks imagine the hope you've got that you're just going to hang out with Prince and it's going to be cool to this is threatening and violent and I'm having a total meltdown and remembering my childhood traumas and I'm in a house, I don't know where I am, and I don't know and, how to And get everything's out of this. really weird. Yeah. Right, yeah. I think the whole thing was Prince being hilarious, putting on an act. So you think the whole thing is a prank? Yeah, now look, you've got to have to explain it. That is. Hang that on, is I need there. to tell more. Yeah, I'll oh, carry on, carry on. And then soup is served, mm. and Sinead doesn't want any. Yeah, because she's going, Do you want she's soup. In... No, I really don't. Have some soup. No, I'm yeah, really So he forces soup. Yeah. But she says it's like he's bullying. Igor, yeah. to give her soup. And because she realises it's a power game, she says, no, I don't want any soup because she doesn't want to be part of humiliating. Yeah. So she just point blank refuses soup. And then Prince says to her, OK, look, this has started off a bit funny. Can we start again? And he goes and gets some pillows and says, shall we have a pillow fight? Yeah. Right? And she kind of thinks, 
okay, let's see if we can start this again. Let's have a pillow fight. She says that he's put something heavy in his and he's hitting her with it and it hurts. Yeah. How is that a prank? No, that's, that's not right. It's not. That's not good. I can't completely defend it. It's just that all of it just sounds like the sort of pranks that they did all the time really? that they used to talk about. It's so weird, And they're put on characters and they'll set up a scenario. But anyway, then she completely freaks out and runs out of the house. He's chasing her. She's running in the ground. She can't get out. There's a fence all around it. She's hiding behind a tree. They can't find her. And when they're not looking and the gate's open to let a car out or something, she runs out and she just follows the lights of the car all down the hill to find the road. She can't even find the road. She's walking all night, it's dawn, it's morning now, she's still walking, and then Prince actually finds her. He pulls up and then gets out and starts trying to chase her again. Yes, but they're running around yeah, the it's, car. Yeah, it's completely insane. Imagine driving to work that morning. And Prince is just... you know, running around the car. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, wow. Must be amazing living in LA. You, <laughs> know, you see stuff like that all the time. <laughs> right, Prince is not an evil person. He, He's I've a read weirdo. A, he is eccentric, right? But then she says she later on finds out she's quite traumatized by this event. Yeah. Yeah. And she later on finds out that Prince had some beef with the manager, Steve Fargo. Oh, and that, yeah. And they'd split up at that point. And it was a prank that was meant for him or something, but something had gone wrong. But you keep I, calling it a prank. I do, because I think the whole thing was set up as a prank. I that, think like, that would be really funny if we did this, but not knowing who she really is. Because if you looked at her and she's this shaven-headed, confident-seeming, political activist, hard-ass <laughs> punk type person. You might think she's hard. Yeah, you right. You have no idea that you're going to trigger some massive child abuse flashbacks and absolutely torment this person. I don't think he'd have had a clue that that was going to do that. I think. Then what? Do you, how do you think when she's? bolting from the house. I don't know. I can't completely defend it. I've just been trying to rationalise it. <laughs> no, because it's because so I've never odd. heard anything like so it. Like, and I in don't the think millions of stories I... and books I've read about Prince, I've never heard anything like it. You hear loads of weird stories about Prince go, can we play some ping pong? He comes in and plays ping pong and then just leaves. You know, you hear weird things like that. I've never heard him being mean, nasty to anybody. Okay, all right. So uh, that's just me trying to process, what the hell is this? Because I don't disbelieve her. I have no reason to. She's the most intelligent, interesting. I know she's totally stoned, but I think the point where she said that was really triggering for me is where she crumbled. Yeah, I can see it differently now. But I also think at some point, if it was truly a prank, by the time she's running to the front door, Prince should be going, Sinead, I was fucking with you. Well, maybe he was when he was chasing her. Oh, and he was like, come back. Oh, and at that point, she was so triggered. She's like, that, yeah, that's a lie to get me to come back. Maybe he was trying to back. catch up with her to explain. or You don't know, because she's so freaked out even to see him. She's really, Maybe he's running going, no, please, let's talk about this. You don't know. That could be the other side of it. We'll never know. Both of oh them are God, dead. So, oh, my God. So, second album is truly a global smash. Nothing compares to you. She's making millions of dollars. Then she has these horrible encounters with men in Hollywood, not least Arsenio Hall. She realised, I mean, she never wanted that level of fame. She never wanted a Hollywood life. Mm. And she finds out very quickly, I would say within a year, that she doesn't even want to be there. And she leaves America and she gives her house to the Red Cross. Yeah, amazing. She just doesn't want to profit from it. She's really angry about it all. Yeah. I but she's just it. forever true to her she really ideals is. and her politics. Yeah, she doesn't stuff. want to be part of this music industry bollocks. And it's just, you know how so many rock stars are so-called philanthropists mm. and they give a certain amount of money. They have their cause they talk about sometimes. Mm. I didn't know Sinead had given her house to the Red Chorus before I read this book. And I know a lot about her. So she's actually quietly doing. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Maybe the ones who don't shout the loudest are actually the ones who are doing the most. Maybe, yeah. Because it's not a career move. Yeah, except she ends up quite broke, so she can't do that much. (laughs) (laughs) Shit. Yeah. Anyway, the Pope. The Pope. Saturday Night Live. Yeah. So we've already mentioned that that was her mum's picture and that nobody gave a shit about the children of Ireland, least of all the Pope. And she was about to go on Saturday Night Live and she realised 
this is the moment also leading up to that. She'd been hanging out in this Rasta bar in New York City that she just stumbled upon. Well, she, it was opposite the Irish pub. Opposite the Irish bar when she was initially hanging out just to smoke weed and drink coffee. And then she suddenly realises opposite is an even better place. She, she said they take her in like a stray kitten. And then she's asking them questions and they can't believe they think she's a boy for ages. Yeah. This one day she's really at home there, loves it there. And this one bloke, Terry, says, by the way, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me because I've been running drugs from here. All the kids that come in and out with their school bags have actually got drugs and guns and I'm using them as mules and I'm treading on someone else's territory and they're going to kill me. They've already tried. And they did kill him on that Monday. And she was so angry with him, so angry with all of it. That was the thing that pushed her going, now's the time. Went on a Saturday Night Live. She knew what she was doing because she got them to rehearse the song she was singing and then had a picture of something else and said to the camera, zoom up on this. And when she did it for real, it was the Pope. And she said, fight the real enemy. She said that was the message to the people who were going to kill Terry. And then she blew out a candle. That's just performance art. Yeah. I didn't realise it was that dramatic. And then she became public enemy number one, yeah. didn't she? And that's when she says, I'm a protest singer, I'm not a pop star. Yeah. Although everyone said that's killed your career. She said, this is the beginning of my career. Oh, she said having a worldwide number one derailed her Yes. Career. When she ripped up that picture, she said, Saturday Night Live is such a raucous show. She said that when she ripped up that picture, there was just a stunned silence. Yeah. And they went straight to commercial break. Like... After Grace Jones hit Russell Hart. Yes, it's very similar. No one would talk to her backstage. No one talked to Sinead backstage. Everybody had disappeared. So yeah. after that happened, Sinead was completely on her own. Yeah. yeah, it's really exactly the same. Yeah, so any controversial moment that happens on a live TV show, people disappear. I suppose they're straight into a meeting. Oh, thinking, I bet they are. What the Damage heck are we control meetings. Do? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that that would be exactly what happens. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're just hiding. <laughs> <laughs> so Sinead has not ever regretted that. Like she said, having the million... Oh, it made her. Yeah, yeah, having the millions selling album derailed her career. Yeah. Actually ripping a picture of the Pope got it back. It did, didn't it? But then straight after that, she's at Madison Square Gardens. At the Bob Dylan. Yeah, thing. singing to celebrate Bob Dylan's life. And she had a song all lined up, one of his songs, and he was a father figure to her when she was young listening to his records and it was a really whispery song where she was really connecting emotionally and so when she went on the stage to sing it she had never heard such a loud sound even at her own gigs when because half the audience were booing and half were cheering and then they're both trying to drown each other out what's amazing as well while that's happening and i would say the boos are you can hear them clearer than the cheers Mm. Is that she stands there almost like, well, I can't start singing with this level of noise. Then she steps away from the microphone and just looks out at the audience. Think, fucking hell, the balls it's on that woman. It's very confrontational, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh it, it's engaging with it, but it also seems sad. And I, I, I was just rooting for her just to start quietly singing. Yeah. So I think if she'd have quietly sung, the quieter almost it was, the more it would have drawn people in. But then maybe it wouldn't. But I love what she did anyway. I'd love to have heard her sing that, though. But I love what she did. She just starts really yell singing Bob Marley song War yeah. and then adds some child abuse words at the end and then just leaves. Chris Christopherson comes on. That photo her. of Chris Christopherson coming on, he puts his hand, like, on the back of her neck. There's been a lot of feminist discussion about that in the last few years, about, you know, how patronising it is for a man to come out and Sinead O'Connor even says that she could see him coming across the stage and she was thinking I don't need a man to come and help Mm. me thinking about it from Chris Christopherson's point of view and his upbringing he's a bit of a cowboy he would have felt very protective Mm. of her Mm. and from his point of hearing the crowd make that noise at her it was quite instinctive for him Mm to go and put his hand on her shoulder and make sure she was all right. I don't think it's a necessarily bad thing. But no, Sinead O'Connor did not need him to do that. No. But she did say, if anybody should have done that, it should have been Bob Dylan because he was stood on the side of the stage and he watched it all happen. She said when she walked off with Chris Christopherson, she looked at Bob Dylan and she says that he's glaring at her like he's my big brother who just told my parents I skipped school. He stares back at me baffled. And she just says it was one of the weirdest moments yeah. of her life. But there's so much more comes into play again because she probably feels let down by her father. 
you weren't there for me. You weren't protecting me when I needed it. You know, that's that's her father figure. She very much says it a lot. How much? But I felt let down by Bob Dylan over this. Yeah, but he didn't was, know he was her father. He was the figure. world's most famous protest singer. Who should have known Sinead O'Connor what she was doing inside out? He should have backed her up. Good point. Bob, yeah. you've let us down Babble. yet again. <laughs> <laughs> well, but whereas Chris Christopherson actually said it on the microphone, "Don't let the bastards grind you down," which is actually very supportive. Yeah, cool. I'm glad somebody came out. I, I think that's an instinctive like thing to do. Like solidarity, even I'd have done it. And you know, actually, a, a woman, man doesn't matter. You'd have just yeah, just to stand by someone who's getting abused on stage. But also, I imagine the people who are booing Sinead, like the people who are cheering Sinead, we don't have to worry about so much. The people who are booing Sinead are probably Chris Christopherson fans. Oh my actually. god, yeah, that's true. But you know what? They're there to support Bob Dylan, like you said, a protest singer, and they boo yeah, a protest singer. Yeah. Come on, people, we should boo that audience. <laughs> yeah. Rubbish. And you know what? The funny thing about this is it's not the last bit of trouble she gets into in America. No, of course <laughs> not. The next thing someone asks her, do you want to play the anthem, national anthem before your gig? And she's like, nah, it's a bit naff, really. The only person who makes it cool is Jimi Hendrix, she's thinking. And the next thing they say, she insisted that she doesn't want the national anthem. She hates America. Oh, uh, they spun it right around. Well, yeah, they're trying to bring it down. Yeah. I-, I wouldn't be surprised if that was record executives because they actually realised that they need to kill her career right. so that she can't tell anyone the truth of the record industry. I love that she put a wig on and she joined one of the anti Sinead protests. Amazing. So, yeah, and her mate put wigs on. And they made the news. Yeah. They actually got on the news, they interviewed them, <laughs> talking against themselves. See, she's a funny lady. Yeah, definitely. She has a great sense of humour. Definitely. And she says that MC Hammer said that she needs to leave America straight away. She says, come to think of it, if there is one reason... <laughs> <laughs> she said, actually, come to think of it, there is one reason to leave America. MC Hammer's videos. Christ almighty. <laughs> she means that. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, she's got this weird thing where she's... Um, and you never believe in when people are psychic or have weird... Do you believe her? No. <laughs> she can see the interiors of people's houses. As she talks to people, she starts to uncontrollably see the interior of their house. And it's quite a niche skill. Then she, it's so bizarre. And then she'll describe it to them and they'll go, yeah, that's exactly my house. It is weird. It's really weird. But she did say uh, as well that one night when things were bad, she got down on her knees to pray and she said this mist just appeared next to her. So I'm very aware at how attuned she is yeah. to spirituality and religion. And yeah, so you're saying you vaguely, potentially might be open to thinking that it, she might have that weird thing. I'm vaguely <laughs> coming <laughs> yeah. round to the idea that Dolly Parton started. <laughs> that might be an angel, yeah. There might be angels. <laughs> and if I start... <laughs> If I start believing in angels and I have to open up to other things yes. like Sinead O'Connor being a medium on interior design, yeah, yeah why not? Yeah. <laughs> why not? But it's bizarre, isn't it? It's really weird. But she obviously believes in it enough to write it in her autobiography. Yeah, because she said, I want this to stop happening. I'm talking to people <laughs> and I can just see inside their house. Like, you know, like Whoopi Goldberg on yeah. The Ghost, who like pretends to be a psychic. Then all of a sudden she's like, no, stop it. Stop talking. Yeah, exactly. Do Sinead O'Connor. Connor is talking to people and their lounges and yeah. kitchens are manifesting yeah. in their house. Like, oh, stop it. Stop. <laughs> it is weird. It's weird. Yeah. Anyway, she knocked out a few more kids and a load more albums. Yeah, we're running out That's of That's to time, summarise. But it is. But... And, and even she does. Each chapter is just an album and she just describes what went into yeah. it, which would mean a lot more to you. Yeah, it did. Imagine, because really you know the songs. Yeah. Was it really good to read Oh, about I loved reading the background. Them. Yeah, of course. You know, it's like reading about Van Gogh's paintings. Do I don't I... say that lightly. I, I consider her an absolute true artist. artist. Yeah. yeah and I, I realise this now. She's a remarkable person. I don't even say this, like, really when people die, but I do think the world is a poorer place for not having her voice yeah. in it. Yeah. I mean, she's left a legacy, mind you. But oh, it's just such a shame. She was still so young, really. Yeah. There was still so much left in that woman. Do you know that one of her sons um, took his own life I for do. like a year before she did? I do. Yeah, I think it was kind of the beginning of the end for yeah. her. 
Oh, it's just so unspeakably sad. I know. Her big breakdown was in 2016, and she just said she had an open surgery radical hysterectomy, which led to a breakdown because they didn't provide her with hormone replacement therapy, and she just never really recovered, and she's suicidal and depressed from then on. That was some of the times where she would do videos on Facebook and stuff, and it was like, oh, no, somebody please go and help yeah, her. Yeah, you told me about a few of them. It's the only yeah. reason I know, because I just... She was so desperate it. at that stage, bless her. She you obviously know- had some custody battles as well, so that's... Yeah, it, it's that thing, isn't it? It's kind of like if you have a child with someone and you're not with that person mm. anymore, if that person can also see that you're mentally unstable, they're going to want to take custody of the child Yeah, because they're worried about the child. And I... I get that i don't yeah. think it's because sinead is not well yeah but apparently one of her husbands well one of the fathers of a kid took the child when she was ill and then stuck it in a foster home for six months because oh he didn't even want to look after right. it. he just didn't want yeah. sinead to there's a lot going on that she doesn't get into details about she just skims over she says i had four kids with four different fathers I married only one of them. I also married three other men, none of which I had yeah. kids with. I mean, there's tons going on in this fairly short life. It's mm-hmm. very full and very complicated. And there's lots of fun and lovely moments as well. Like when she oh, gets to look after Muhammad Ali at yes, the Olympics and stuff. Hero. And that's great. Yeah. It's really great. There's some really nice bits. And Lou in this Reed. Book. Yeah, there's loads, actually. Because somebody had said to us, this is a harrowing read, and I didn't find it that at all. No, I, I didn't I lapped it, it up. I really enjoyed and I talking to her. also think that Sinead didn't want it to be harrowing no. because she could have so easily oh, yeah. made it harrowing. No. And I think she knows this book would be around a lot longer than yeah. she was. And so she wants to be... Rem- the book's called Rememberings, right? Yeah. But she wants to be remembered in this way through her music yeah, I agree. and i think in her book Which where, is her f- telling her story as she wants it to, her to be remembered yeah well, i love she, i love she, that she's amazing. been vindicated yeah i love that she was right yeah i love That's, that she's been proven to be right yeah and you know everything oh i love as well like in the last few years she was studying to become a healthcare professional yes. and a care and she did a lot of work for no veteran dies alone yeah just to be a companion to people yeah. who die. Yeah, no, and she found it the most meaningful thing she'd ever done. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. Again, that does go to show that she never... Like, worldwide fame was not ever her goal. I can't think of anybody else who's sold 20 million albums worldwide, giving up time to go and work in care yeah, homes you're right. and stuff. Like, who would do you that? You know what someone might do is build a massive school in Africa with your name on it, yeah. where she actually just sits quietly with a 92-year-old yeah. and talks to them yeah. one-to-one. Had she not died, her next album was going to be called No Veteran Dies Alone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we never get to hear it. All right. I have to say thank you for finding this book because you've made me understand how amazing Sinead O'Connor is. She is really is amazing. You've made me realise I have massive respect for her. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Thrift Shop Biography. We love making this podcast and we're absolutely thrilled that so many of you are already listening. Um, We're new to this and you could really help us out by leaving us a review somewhere, wherever you listen to this podcast. And if you could share us, tell your friends about us or drop some links on social media. We have a Facebook page called Thrift Shop Biography. So make sure you come over there to hear about the episodes first and what else we're up to. Okay, see you next week. And if you're new here, there are loads more episodes now to go and listen in the back catalogue. So make sure you go and enjoy them. Okay, thank you very much. Bye.